Welcome to St. Martin in the Fields Parish Church, London, and the story of Nell Gwynne. Eleanor Nell Gwynne was born on the 2nd of February, 1650. She was a London heroine with a rags to riches story to rival both Cinderella and Eliza Doolittle. Although her life began with hardship, her ancestry tells a very different story. Her family tree was recorded by Anthony Wood, an antiquarian, and Nell's skeleton tree was published in an almanac for the year 1681. Gwyn is an old Welsh family name and descended from the tribe of Gwyn ap Gruffydd, from which Nell Gwyn descended in the male line. This ancestry is disputed and some believe she was low born, although it is possible that during the English Commonwealth her family fell on hard times. Nell Gwyn's father was Captain Thomas Gwyn and her mother Ellen maiden named Smith, is said to have drowned when she fell into the water at her house near Chelsea. She was buried on the 30th of July, 1679, in her 56th year, here at St. Martin in the Fields Parish Church. The following document records her burial in this parish church. Nell's rise began with the embodiment of the Bawdy Restoration Era from an orange cellar of Covent Garden. She would eventually step up as an actress and would eventually enjoy a position as a favourite mistress to King Charles II for nearly 20 years. A short but significant life has inspired several films, plays and novels. And whilst we explore St. Martin in the Fields Church, which holds a prominent position on Trafalgar Square, London, a location which plays an important part in her legacy, we will take a little look at Nell's extraordinary story. We begin in Covent Garden. Nell's birthplace is disputed while some claim she was born in Hereford, she may also have sprang to life in Coal Yard Alley of Drury Lane. Her baptism is missing from the public records. If she was of London birth, it could be that her record of baptism was destroyed in the Great Fire, or simply not recorded. As many records are lost, or were left unrecorded, during the time of Cromwell. Her father is said to be Captain Thomas Gwynne. Her mother, Madame Ellen Gwynne, keeper of a brothel in Covent Garden. Little is known of Nell's early life. While she probably helped her mother in the boarding house, it's unclear if she was a child prostitute. It's possible she worked as a street hawker of oysters, or a cinder girl. Samuel Peps reports that Nell said she was brought up in a bawdy house to fill strong waters to the guests. Bringing brandy to Covent Garden brothel visitors does not seem an auspicious start for a girl who would go on to influence the king. Theatre Royal Drury Lane after being banned by Cromwell, theatres were reinstated by Charles II in the 1660s. The so-called Merry Monarch not only licensed two acting companies, he legalised the profession for women, bringing England up to speed with its European counterparts in allowing women on the stage. Around 1664, former prostitute called Mary Meggs, or Orange Mole, 
hired Nell and her older sister Rose to help her sell oranges in the King's Playhouse, called the Theatre in Bridges Street. Now, the Theatre Royal drew the name. While working, Nell caught the attention of someone at the theatre. Possibly one of the actors, Charles Hart, aged around 14, she became one of the actresses in the troupe and Hart's mistress. Nell's first recorded appearance on stage was in 1665 in Dryden's Indian Emperor. A later performance in Howard's The English Monsieur won her Samuel Pepys famous epithet, Pretty Witty Nell. Her comedic talent brought Nell leading roles and She became mistress to Charles Sackville, Lord Buckhurst, in 1667. The next year she was introduced to the king and became his lover. Nell is said to have nicknamed the king, her Charles III, in a nod to her previous relationships. Pretty witty Nell. There are plenty of great Nell quotes to persuade anyone unsure of her intelligence and one of her quotes, reported by Comte de Gramont, recalls an event in 1681. Nell Gwynne was passing through the streets in her coach when the mob mistook her for a rival, the Duchess of Portsmouth, and began hooting and calling her all kinds of names. Putting her head out of the coach window, she addressed the crowd. Good people, she said, smiling. You are mistaken. I am the Protestant whore. The Catholic whore was the Duchess of Portsmouth, a sophisticated Frenchwoman, and another of the King's many mistresses. After 11 years of puritanical rule under Cromwell, Nell was a generous, reckless, infectiously charismatic character the populace and the pamphleteers were looking for. In February 1671, Nell moved into a townhouse owned by the king, 79 Pall Mall. Five years later, she was granted a lease from the property. All of Charles's various mistresses, there are at least a dozen over the years, Nell was seen as being the least greedy for royal favours. However, she was apparently disappointed about only being a lessee. Nell is said to have complained. She had always conveyed free under the crown and always would and would not accept the house if it was conveyed free to her by an act of parliament. In 1676 her pleas were answered and she was granted freehold of the property. 79 Pall Mall remained in Gwynne's family until 1693. As of 1960, the property was still the only one on the south side of Pall Mall, not on the crown. On King Charles's deathbed in 1685, he left a request, let not poor Nelly starve. Nelly was left with a 1,500 a year pension about £150,000 in today's money. All of her debts were paid by James II, Charles's younger brother and heir. Three years later, in March 1687, Gwynne suffered a stroke that left her paralysed on one side. In May 1687, a second stroke left her confined to the bed in her Pall Mall house. Now Gwynne died apoplexy, possibly due to a strain of syphilis, 14th of November 1687. It is here in St Martin in the Fields that Nell Gwynne was laid to rest. The following parish document records her burial. You will see that it is underlined. It was a simple way to showcase the importance of the burial and record. Burial inside churches had become fashionable in the mid-17th century. 
because of the expense it was seen as the mark of a successful career because were often buried beneath their altars. Nell became friends with Thomas Tennyson, vicar of St. Martin in the Fields and later Archbishop of Canterbury. Late in her life, he conducted her funeral and allowed Nell's body to be interred in his space below the altar when she was buried on the 17th of November 1687. In accordance with one of her final wishes, Tennyson preached a sermon from Luke 15, 7. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The geographical distance between Nell's possible birthplace and burial isn't far, about half a mile. Yet the difference in her social status from birth to death is extraordinary. Nell Gwynne is still remembered in London and her name has been used for public houses as well as London apartments. She gives her name to a tiny traditional pub near the Strand. Then there's a rather smart art deco building in Chelsea called Nell Gwynne House Apartments with a statue of her over the door. In this statue there are spaniels in Elsie. Sight explains, as corgis are to Elizabeth II, so these spaniels were to Charles II. Down the road in Sloane Square, Nell's relationship with the king is immortalised in the Venus Fountain installed in 1953. And then there's Nell Gwynne Nursery School in Suffolk. The following document is the last will and testament of Nell Gwynne. It reads, Last request Mrs. Ellen Gwynne to His Grace, the Duke of St. Albans, made October the 18th, 1687. I desire I may be buried in the church, St. Martin in the Fields, that Dr. Tennyson may preach my funeral sermon, that there may be a decent pulpit cloth and cushion given to St. Martin in the Fields, that he, the Duke, would give one hundred pounds for the use of poor to the said St. Martins St. James's Westminster to be given into the hands of the said Dr. Tennyson to be disposed of at his discretion for taking any poor debtors of the said parish out of prison and for the clothes of this winter and other necessaries I shall find most fit that for showing my charity to those who differ from me in religion, I desire that £50 may be put into the hands of Dr. Tennyson and Mr. Warner, who, taking to them any two persons of the Roman religion, may dispose of it for the use of the poor of that religion, inhabiting the parish of St. James aforesaid. That Mrs. Rose Forster, may have £200 given to her any time within a year after my decease. That Joe, my porter, may have £10 given him. My request to his grace is further. That my present nurses may have £10 each and mourning besides their wages due to them. That my present servants may have mourning each and a year's wages, besides their wages due. But the Lady Fairborn may have fifty pounds, given to her to buy a ring. That my kinsman, Mr. Colmley, may have one hundred pounds given to him within a year after his date. That His Grace would please to lay out twenty pounds yearly the releasing of poor debtors out of prison every Christmas day. That Mr. John Warner 
may have 50 pounds given him to buy a ring. That the lady Hollyman may have a pension of 10 shillings per week continued to her during the said lady's life. I will finish this video with a selection of paintings and photography, some depicting Nell Gwyn and some showcasing this beautiful church. A big thank you for joining me. And bye for now.